Hello, this is a book review of Breakout Nations by Rushir Sharma. My name is Michael Lortz, and this book review was done for the University of South Florida MBA program, International Marketing Course, MAR 6158, Summer 2016. This book review's table of contents will include key points, a summary, assumptions by the author, strengths and weaknesses of the book, and my reviewer thoughts. A brief summary. Rashir Sharma is the Head of Emerging Markets and Chief Global Strategist at Morgan Stanley Investment Management. Breakout Nations is his look at the economics of over a dozen different nations. Sharma describes past investments ideas that emerging markets can be grouped as investments. So he cites the BRIC, which was Brazil, Russia, India, and China, and investors thought that all these countries moved up and down as a block. So all emerging markets moved simultaneously. He concludes that there are too many differences between nations for grouping to be effective and profitable for investors. Sharma details how due to globalization and several bursting bubbles in 1997-98 in Asia, in 2003 the US tech market, and in 2008 the global market, there will be an era of moderate uneven growth throughout the world now. The, the idea that nations will be hinged together is no longer the case. Point two, nations can no longer ride the coattails of great powers to ensure their economic survival. So more nations are on their own now in developing strong economic plans for growth. There will be wider gaps in performance between rival economies and markets. Again, no longer moving as a block. And as Sharma says in his final chapter, now everyone has to row. There's no more sitting in the wake of a giant nation doing all the work. Now Sharma also breaks his book down into individual nations. Each nation is given a chapter, and some nations are grouped together by regions. So he starts with China, and he says that China is slowing down, middle class growth, need to innovate, debt too high when compared to GDP. Those are India's problems. Or no, those are China's problems. India's problems are cronyism, stagnation in upper echelons, regionalization of growth, and can a growing population be set up with education and jobs? In Brazil, there is poor infrastructure investment, high inflation, too many government programs, too slow growth, and unskilled workers. In Mexico, it's a controlled market with high inequality, little growth, oligarchy, and slow progress. Russia... Sharma writes, has little government investment, dual system, of free and, dual system of free and authoritarian, reliance on high oil prices, financial sector missing, aging population, weak small business sector. In Turkey, the president of Turkey is seizing more power, vulnerable to foreign debt, taxing heavy on a few, secular moderation, and their relationship with the EU could all change things. Now this, of course, was written in 2011 and updated in 2012. We have since seen a coup in Turkey and other, other situations in that region to include ISIS that, would, that may affect Turkey's economics. In Indonesia, Sharma writes that they're competing with China, they have cautious growth and stability, decentralization and provincial power, and exports only 25% of their economy. Poland and the Czech Republic, Sharma was kind of high on in that he said that there's little debt and they have followed EU guidelines for reform to the letter, whereas other countries have veered off in their own direction, such as Greece or Spain. Poland and the Czech Republic have maintained the EU guidelines for reform. He continues with the Philippines and mentions that they have unstable government, little savings, high consumption, cronyism and corruption, too many locals leaving to find work, and high urbanization. In Thailand, he finds a flat domestic market and a rural versus elite tension. In Malaysia, he finds an inferiority complex, foreign, in in foreign direct investment falling, and too much central planning. Now, he, his, he is high on South Korea, although he warns that there's growth from cheap to quality products, meddlesome government regulations. However, there is a sense of urgency, and the KOSPI has become the indicator of global trends. In South Africa, he finds severe unemployment, wealth in white hands, no dynamic competition, money controlled by a few in a high welfare state. 
Sharma then talks about the frontier markets as their own chapter. He talks about Sri Lanka needing less military, more vocation, and that they're recovering from a civil war. He finds Vietnam with a poor, poorly run command economy and poor shipping infrastructure. Nigeria needs more infrastructure development, overcrowded cities and limited go- growth space. Then he talks about the Gulf states of UAE, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, etc. And that they need high pr- oil prices to continue to grow. And that there's little action away from oil and that they rely too heavily on a foreign workforce. Now as for the United States, he mentioned this the U.S. in the final chapters. He says the U.S. is in good shape because they're poised for innovation. The U.S. dollar is strong. And shale gas is helping drive businesses and reduce commodity cost. Sharma talks a lot about commodity cost in his later chapters. He talks about the idea that people are drifting their investments away from innovation and into the commodity markets. And he said that this is a problem because what it's doing is it's driving up the cost of commodities such as oil. And when you drive up the cost of oil, you're preventing manufacturing and companies that need the oil at low cost to grow. So the commodity broker drives up the price of oil because they're sitting on the oil. The manufacturing companies cannot buy the oil or have to spend more on oil so less money goes into research and development. That's not a good way to drive an economy because you need more money in research and development and less cost on the fuels and the commodities needed. Now Sharma also writes that the U.S. is in bad shape because of high debt and that the soft landing after 2008 did not force enough reform after the recession. He also says that inequality is a major problem both in the U.S. and in other nations across the world. Now, Sharma does have a few assumptions. He assumes rational behavior is based on money. Money will always transfer, not collapse. Type of governments do not matter. What matters is sound economic policy and stability. Hard crashes are better than re- for reform than soft landings. And this quote from his later chapters I found particularly interesting. It is not the depth of the decline in GDP or employment that matters, but how aggressively leaders accept the need to get control of debts and to create the competitive conditions in which lending, investments, and exports will bounce back. I found that quote particularly interesting. The strengths of the book, I found it very well researched. No region was left undiscussed. It was not afraid to be critical. It was theoretically sound. And for me personally, it was a great intro into political economics and global systems. Sharma's weaknesses, however, he brushes off major disruptions. He says that markets are bad at foreshadowing financial implications of war, so he barely mentions it. He dismisses the social side of hard crashes. This I found as a big weakness. Sometimes hard crashes lead to total government reform and removal of power or potential spillover for, for, for fanaticism, such as the Nazism, such as ISIS. When a system crashes and those in power are removed, they have lost power. So this to me was a huge gap in his his book, in that people who are in power want to do soft landings so they stay in power, because hard landings disrupt the social fabric of a country or of a society, and they're more likely to vote the bums out, or cause a revolution, or the party will change, the party in power will change. So a hard crash might not keep those in power who want to maintain power. And on top of that, a hard crash could cause, as I said, spillover fanaticism. So a hard crash in a neighboring country could drive unemployment so high that a fanatic of some philosophy, be it religion or some ideology, comes in, riles up the masses, and they burn down City Hall, And they cause havoc throughout the entire region, as we're seeing with ISIS. Sharma also doesn't describe how is trade limited by regime type. Although a nation could be stable, it might be limited in trade partners and growth due to philosophy. For example, Iran. By taking a strong anti-American approach in 1979, Iran limited its ability to trade with the U.S. So could Iran have grown more if they toned down their rhetoric? My thoughts, though, I enjoyed Breakout Nations. It was my first venture into a political economics book. I would not base my entire global understanding on breakout nations, but it is an important piece of the puzzle. As I mentioned, there's a huge gap in social understanding and social movements. I don't know how you would bring those two together, though. 
I think you would have to read a book on one and a book on the other and bring the two of them together in your own head. I think trying to blend economics with social science is extremely difficult, although people need to be ver versed in both. I found Breakout Nation to be a better version of a Thomas Friedman book. And the world is flat, etc. Sharma digs deeper than Friedman. Friedman has a very flowery, cloud, pie in the sky type writing style. And Sharma got deep into the weeds. Personally, my background is in social sciences, international affairs, military defense, and security. Stability comes from security. To me, that's the first step. Economic opportunity and growth is the second step. And that's where breakout nations is strong. The U.S. prefers democracy to go along with opportunity. Not always the case, as Sharma says. Um, it's not always the case for economic growth. You can have a command economy as long as the command economy and gives the right guidance for, an econo for economic growth. Now lastly, human rights follows democracy and opportunity. The democracy and opportunity might not happen in the command economies. Final slide is I would recommend Breakout Nations. And I personally would be interested in reading Sharma's other book, The Rise and Fall of Nations, which was just published in 2016.